Welcome to Equity Mate Studio. Now, this session will provide an overview of Fairlight's quality investing framework, along with relevant stock examples. So it's called a framework for quality investing. Now, the focus this afternoon will be on how industry structure, competitive positioning, profitability, returns on capital and valuation all intersect to produce companies capable of compounding shareholder return value for the long term. Now we've got Will Dowd here, who is the co-founder and portfolio manager of Fairlight. Welcome, Will. Come on the stage. I'll just do the disclaimer. Sorry that we started a little bit late. I didn't know he was here. <laughs> um, now, all of the information presented today is for education and entertainment purposes only. Any advice is general advice and does not take into account your personal circumstances. If you are, or your needs or objectives, before acting on general advice, as you know, consider whether it's relevant um, to your needs and read the relevant PDSs. So if you're unsure, speak to a financial professional. And finally, Equitymates now has the AFSL and the license number is 540697. I'm Felicity, co-host of Talk Money To Me. Welcome, Will. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for coming, everybody. Uh, I'm glad my very exciting title has gotten you guys interested. I mean, I'm competing against crypto and blockchain and stuff, but long-term uh, investing gets me excited, so here we are. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is Fairlight's quality, quality investing framework, but I'm actually going to use two stock examples to kind of step through how we look at businesses, how we analyze them, and kind of go, go through the process of putting together the fund. So um, as a bit of background, Fairlight, we run one fund, uh, a global smaller mid-cap fund. It's quality focused. We own 30 to 40 securities, and we are long-term fundamental investors. So, once we find a great company, we want to own it for the long term, let it compound earnings for us for years, decades, ideally. Um, and so we've owned many of our businesses for the five years um, that the business has been running for. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to keep it really, really simple. Four things. Industry, competition, profitability, and valuation. So this is kind of from a high level, the four things that we look at when we are starting the process of analyzing a business. and seeing if it, it suits our portfolio. And now, before I jump into that, I want to introduce you to the two stocks that we're going to be talking about today. So I said before, you know, long-term investing is very boring, um, but I can tell you the returns can sometimes be anything but. So I'm going to do this backwards. I'm going to talk about the returns these stocks have given, and then I'm going to tell you what they actually do. So the first, stock number one, is the green line. That's delivered investors a return of 29% per annum for the last 20 years. So that's 200 times your original investment if you manage to get on board on day one. Business number two in the orange line has delivered investors 17% per annum if you could hold on for the entire 20 years. Again, that's pretty impressive. I mean, it gets dwarfed by the green line, but that's still pretty good. And then the gray line down the very bottom, that's actually the S&P 500. I mean, that's on 8% per annum. That's pretty good. You would not turn your nose up on that. But that's just to give you kind of a reference point of, of what these businesses have been able to do. And so at Fairlight, we believe that stock prices follow earnings. So we want to find businesses that can grow earnings because if you hold them for long enough, the stock price will follow. And so the next question is, how have these businesses grown their earnings? So the business on the left that did 29% per annum shareholder returns, you can see there that business has grown earnings at 22% per annum for the last two decades. The business on the right, that has done 13% per annum for the last two decades. So, I mean, these are some pretty impressive numbers. Um, and now, the reason that I've done this backwards is a lot of the, the misconceptions, I think, or we think in, in markets is to get a business that can grow earnings at 22% per annum, you know, do we need to be buying the latest high-flying industry? Do we need to be in, you know, biotechnology and crypto and software and, and whatnot? I mean, these are all great industries, but um, this might surprise you what these businesses actually do. So. Our philosophy is be boring and make money. So business on the left-hand side, ODFL, that's actually a trucking company. Um, and the business on the right-hand side, Lennox, that makes air conditioners. So that's what they do. Um, so I'm going to dive in and tell you a little bit about these two stocks, but tell you a little bit about what makes them special and why we really like them. So Old Dominion Freightline, that was business number one. This business has been around for 100 years. So this is truck number one. It started in the 1930s in Virginia. 
and it spent the next 70 years expanding across the US. Um, and what's really interesting is it's still owned by, or part owned, the original founding family. So these guys, they think in decades, not in the next quarter. Um, and so what do they do? I said that they're a trucking company, but it's actually not a trucking company. And that's a really distinct, important distinction to make. And the reason for that is if you think about trucking in an, as an industry, it's actually very bad for shareholder returns because if you think about it, you're moving goods from A to B. Anybody can go and buy a truck, compete on that route, for example, um, and then they're gonna come in and just compete on price. There's no differentiation. Famously a very bad industry. However, Old Dominion, what they do is less than truckload trucking. So if you're a small business in the US and you need to move a pallet of goods from A to B, um, too big to put in a parcel, too small to hire out an entire truck, you need someone who can, you can just take a small part of a truck. And why does that matter? So Old Dominion operates an incredibly complex network. So if you think about their business, every morning they have a truck that goes across all their customers, picks up all the pallets, you bring that to a distribution center, you sort them all, you put them on another 100 trucks, they go to another 100 cities, then then all sorted again and so on and so forth until you reach the end customer. And so that's an incredibly complex network. And if you want to compete with Old Dominion, you can't start with one truck, you need the whole 250 distribution centers. So there's effectively no new entrants in this market and it's very difficult to compete. And the other factor, so this is a better representation of what Old Dominion looks like today. This is a distribution center, you can see you know, 100 trucks coming in. But what's really interesting is I said before, these guys think in decades. So they've spent 70 years strategically buying plots of land near population centers in the US to put these distribution centers. And so often they'll wait for five, 10 years for a specific piece of land to become available and then they'll buy it in advance of when they need it. And the reason for that is if you're trying to compete in this industry, um, and you go to some residents and say, hey, are you interested, you know, we want to rezone this piece of land to put a distribution center and you're going to have hundreds of trucks thundering past your house every day. The answer is no. So it's almost impossible now to get the land that they have. So they've got two and a half, three billion dollars worth of land. They've been building it for 70 years. Um, and so that's kind of a, a feeling of, of the quality of this business and, and what makes it special. So the second business I'm going to talk about is Lennox International. So what they make is those grey boxes there. Um, those are air conditioners. Now you're going to laugh at me and say, I mean, how hard is it for someone to go and build one of those and, and compete, right? Surely, how have these guys done 15% per annum earnings growth for the last two decades? Well, there's actually a couple of really interesting features about the business that actually makes it quite defensive. So first of all, Lennox doesn't sell to the end customer. What they have is direct distribution to the contractors who install the machines. And so what that means is they've got very deep relationships with the contractor, they hold inventory for the contractor, they've got software they can use. And so if you're a contractor, you've spent years standardizing on one type of equipment, and what matters for you is your time. You just need to get in there, get it installed, you need to make sure it works, and if you need to service it, you need to make sure you know how to service it as well. And then the contractor goes to the end customer and recommends what they should use, and then the end customer, when they get the bill, half of it's labor, half of it is the machine. They've got no price reference point and they just take the recommendation of the contractor. So they have this friendly middleman that sits inside the value chain that recommends their product onto the end customer, which makes it really sticky revenues. And the second part as well is 80% of the revenues come from replacement demand. So if you've got a 15 year old or 20 year old machine and it breaks, you know, you're in the sweltering heat of Texas, you want to get that new machine in your house pretty quickly. So, you know, the, the buying is usually urgent or you're replacing a very old and energy inefficient machine. So it makes sense, you know, from an energy and perspective to upgrade. So that's kind of a quick overview of the two businesses um, that we're going to talk about. So stepping into point number one, with, which is industry. Um, and I said before, you know, a lot of people, and we hear this a lot, and uh, good, good luck to the people who do this. You can make money this way, I'm sure. But we're not looking for the latest, you know, really fast growing industry. In fact, we're looking for the opposite. We want a slow growing, stable industry that gives us two things, really. One, we want really stable, competitive dynamics because that leads to good shareholder returns. You don't want an industry to be the target of new venture capital funds, private equity funds, etc., because they all come in, they c compete away the excess returns 
and you're left with nothing. So for us, slow growing industries are great. The second thing that we want is, we want to be able to say with high confidence, five, 10, 20 years from now, this industry is going to be bigger and better. And so a really good example is on the left hand side, that is the total tonnage moved in the US by truck. That grows at 2% per annum, right? That's, no one's getting particularly excited about that. That's pretty boring. But underneath that, Old Dominion can still grow earnings at 30% per annum, right? So there's a long gap between industry growth, revenue growth, and then earnings growth, and they're not generally not that correlated. And so what we do know though, fast forward 10 years, we can say with you know 95% probability or confidence that there's gonna be more tonnage being moved by trucks in 10 years time, and Old Dominion is gonna be moving those, those pallets for us. So the second example on the right that's the installed base in the US of, of air conditioners. Again, that's growing at 1% per annum, very boring. But what's really interesting about that is it pretty much never goes down. And every year, a certain percentage of those air conditioners break and they need to be replaced. And so we know five years, 10 years, 20 years, there's gonna be more air conditioners breaking and they're gonna need Linux machines to replace them. So that's kind of a, a counterintuitive look of how we look at industries. We want stability, we want favorable competitive dynamics and, and high probability of being able to forecast the future. Which brings me on to point number two. So how to look at competition. So I guess once you're comfortable with the industry, there's no good if you know there's really aggressive competition and companies are all biting each other's heads off to try and get at the customer. So in an ideal world, as an analyst or as an equity holder, you know every industry would be a, a monopoly, but that's not the case. And so this is where discretion comes in, analysis comes in, because every company is different, every industry is different. But we do look for certain characteristics that we've seen time and time again have worked. And so one example on the left-hand side for uh, Old Dominion in the less than truckload industry, that's a really fragmented market, but it's coalescing around a handful of players. And we think that there's every reason that that will continue to happen. So you can see on the left-hand side, Old Dominion over the last 20 years has increased their market share from 3% to 10%. Why is that? When you're a large player in the less than truckload market, you get better route density. So if you, the more customers that you can pick up along, the more you can get your trucks utilized, you get more profit, but then you can actually bring your prices down and then the people who are smaller who are not getting that route density effectively get competed out. And so this industry now, the top five players are about 50% of the market. We would expect that to continue for the next you know, two, three decades. And so what we have there is Old Dominion is a, a share gainer in a fragmented industry where scale matters and they have scale. So we're pretty comfortable with that. Another type of competitive dynamic that we quite like is a cozy oligopoly. So a monopoly would be great, but next best is you know, we've got five manufacturers, but nobody is really competing that hard. So, I said before that all the relationships sit with the contractor. So there's Lennox, there's four other manufacturers, they've all got the contractors, they've been selling for a long time. Nobody's interested in coming in and cutting their prices and destroying everybody's economic returns. So how can we check that? So the chart on the right, that's the annual price increases that Lennox puts through on their machines. So you can see almost every year, the prices are going up 1%, 2%, 3%. And on the right hand side, um, Last year, prices were up 6%, and this year, prices are up 12%. So just passing that inflation straight on um, to the customer. So you can tell from that 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 is a pretty friendly industry. Nobody is that interested in you know, coming in and, and cutting their prices. And so from Lennox's perspective, you start the year, um, you put your prices up by 2 or 3%. I talked before, the install base grows by 1%, right? You do better products. All of a sudden, you're getting to kind of a high single digit organic growth rate, despite the industry growth really not being that fast. So the next thing we're going to talk about, um, and now bear with me here because I can talk about profitability and financial metrics and ratios for an hour, so I've chosen one. Um, and I'm going to try and explain to you guys what this is and why um, this is the number one thing that Fairlight looks, like, looks at. So for us, we look for quality businesses. How do we tell if a business is quality? Um, for us, it's return on capital. So that's the profits of the business earns divided by its assets, so effectively, how much money has it had to spend to generate its competitive position? So for reference, most businesses generate somewhere between like a six to 10% return on capital because that's the, the equity cost of capital. Any less than that, you're a terrible business. Any more than 10% and you're doing really well because when there's a business that's earning 30%, that attracts a lot of competition and they want to get into that pie effectively. And so 
if we can find a business that's been generating returns on capital above 10% for many decades, you can look at that business and go, okay, there is some kind of competitive advantage, competitive moat that means that it can earn those returns for a long period of time. And so if we look at Lenox and Old Dominion, the gold line is their return on capital for the past two decades. So you can see average 10 to 15% never dipped below eight. And then over the last decade, both of those businesses, their return on capital is approaching 25 to 30%, which is phenomenal um, as equity, you know, equity holdings go um, from two you know, pretty uninteresting and, and boring businesses. But where it gets quite interesting, um, and another sort of aspect that I want to talk about is you'll notice on the green bars, there's two very different trends going on. So the green bars is the capital invested in the business. And you, so you can see Lennox, that hasn't changed almost for the last 15 to 20 years. And that makes sense, right? They've got a US footprint, they've got some manufacturing plants, they need to build more units every year, but you know, they can probably just be a little bit more efficient. They can put another shift on. Lennox doesn't really have an ability to take their profits and reinvest it at a really high rate to return. They've got their moat, they've got their assets in the ground, they earn a really high return on it, but that's it. So what they do is management take their profits every year and then just give it back to shareholders in a dividend or, or a buyback. Um, and so that's good, that's fine. But the truly great businesses that, that compound out huge amounts over the long term we tend to find are those that can take their profits and reinvest it back into the business. And so you can see Old Dominion on, on the right hand side. I said that they've been you know, strategically buying up land, buying these distribution centers, building these distribution centers over the last 20 or 30 years. They've continuously been doing that. So every year they take all their profits and they just plow it back into another distribution center, more land. And the reason they do that is their return on capital is 25%, right? So as a shareholder, you pay me a dividend, what can I do with that? You know, I can reinvest it at 5% or whatever, but if they hold on to that money, reinvest it at 25%, you do that for a very long period of time. And that's how we get to sort of the rates of return that we were talking about at the start of the presentation. So the way that we view Lennox is competitive moat, no reinvestment opportunity. Old Dominion, on the other hand, is, has a competitive moat, but also has a really long reinvestment opportunity to build more of those distribution centers, which theoretically is worth more. Which brings me on to the last slide, um, valuation. So you guys, I'm sure, are well aware. You can do points one, two, and three as well as you want. You can find the absolute best business in the world, and then you pay too much of it, and you still lose money. So that's the great irony of, of investing and what makes it so hard. So at Fairlight, what we are looking for is underappreciated quality. So we do all the work on points one, two, and three. We find all these quality businesses. But then what we're trying to do is find something that the market's missed. Because if you just go out and try and find the 10 best businesses that are obvious to everybody, then they're all gonna be on silly multiples. And you, instead of taking business risk, you're gonna be taking valuation risk. So this is the uh, forward PE ratio of Old Dominion and Lennox over the last 20 years. And it tells quite an interesting story. So both those businesses traded on about 15 to 20 times um, you know, for about a decade. Things got a little bit silly after COVID and you can see the green line there, Old Dominion for a point in time was trading on nearly 40 times earnings. And now, I mean, for a business that is you know, hard assets and tracking 40 times was probably a little bit silly, but what that shows is that the market did points one, two and three and they realized this is a great business, this is amazing, it can grow for decades. And then they just bid it up to a ridiculous multiple and effectively your undoing was in the first work. And so. Since December, um, the multiple on Old Dominion is nearly hard from 40 times to 20 times back towards its, its long-term average. And I think it's quite a good cautionary tale in terms of you can do points one to three as well as you want, but point four is ultimately what matters. You've got to make sure you get the price right. Which brings us to point number two, um, which is Lennox. Again, 15 to 20 times. And then you can see it got up to 30 times. And then Lennox is actually trading on 14 times today. So. Lennox is a business that Fairlight owns. And so I said before that we're looking for underappreciated quality. What is the market missing? So sometimes to buy great businesses, you have to lean into some bad news and it can be quite uncomfortable. Um, and so in Lennox's case, it should be no surprise to you guys, interest rates are going up. So in the US, housing prices are going down. Nobody's building new houses. There's no uh, transactions happening. So the view for the short-term housing market in the US at the moment is very grim. 
So for Lennox in particular, people look at the next 12 to 18 months and they go, okay, well this business is in some big trouble. No one's gonna buy any air conditioners. But for us at Fairlight, our edge we think is, instead of like looking down straight over the precipice, we wanna gaze a little bit further. And so when we see Lennox and you look at three, five, 10 years, there's actually some huge tailwinds for this business. So the first one is, I can tell you, that entire install base of air conditioners I talked about before, they're all 15 years old, and the only way that we get anywhere near net zero is all of these need to be replaced with new, more efficient versions that Lennox makes. And so we see effectively, you know, a bumpy six to 12 months, who knows what that looks like, but we know that it's got the industry tailwinds, people are gonna to need to replace their air conditioners. We know there's a stable competitive environment. And while we're waiting, as I mentioned before, Lennox pays all of our cash back to us for our dividend and a buyback. So on 14 times, your day one, you know, repurchase or dividend yield is sort of six to 7%. And for a business that has a track record of growing earnings at 15% per annum, for us that stacks up pretty nicely. I will say as well though, um, Old Dominion on, on 20 times, we're looking at it very closely because it's fallen a lot and we do love the business. So. That's a very quick look um, at our investment philosophy, two stocks, how we go about it. Um, I'm happy to open it up for questions if anybody wants to ask questions or... Will, my question's about ODFL. Yeah. So you mentioned that ODFL sort of are reinvesting profits back into the business, generating around 25... I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.